see. Now it's there. You go. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, Siobhan. And thank you, Greenwich Library. You guys do such a great job offering so many terrific programs. Um, I love leading them and I love actually just sitting in on them, which I've done a lot. So that's great. Um, okay, welcome everybody. This is the Investing Discussion Group. Uh, this is season two of the discussion group, and this season, our theme is the best-selling books that will help you reach your financial goals faster. We've been having a great time. We do once a month. Uh, and we've done The Psychology of Money and The Bond King and A Random Walk Down Wall Street, and they've really just been fantastic. They live on uh, the Greenwich Library YouTube, um, what do you call that, like the YouTube area, your YouTube page, YouTube. I don't know channel I think it is. Their YouTube channel. Okay, the Greenwich Library YouTube channel. Uh, so they live there. Great discussions, really fun. Um, the Psychology of Money has sold two million copies, which is really unheard of for a personal finance book. So, um, you know, really some terrific gems out there. And uh, don't let, you know, in terms of the Bond King, last year was a dismal year for bonds. And what always happens this is a really bad habit with investors. You know, some investment goes south, sours, bad news, whatever. And then people kind of write it off in their mind, which ironically right now might be the absolute best time to be buying bonds because the maxim is buy low and sell high. So when something has gotten crushed, that's what that's supposed to make it more appealing and at least worth a look. So um, I love doing the Bond King and we really walked through kind of the value of bonds also and things like that. So um, definitely give bonds a listen. And uh, tonight we are doing How to Invest in Real Estate, book by Joshua Dorkin and Brandon Turner, two guys who um, got famous really, I mean, they personally did very well in real estate, kind of just starting from nothing, but then they really got famous being podcasters and they have a huge following um, on this Bigger Pockets podcast. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, so that's what we're doing today, but planning ahead, we meet once a month and in January, uh, since this is the investing discussion group, we try to look at investing from all different angles, you know, obviously stocks and bonds and things like that and strategy, uh, but also, you know, starting a business or being able to invest in somebody else's startup or just being aware of startups in general. That's another area that could be very lucrative. And um, so in January, we're doing kind of celebrating startups, how investors can kind of interact with startups or even consider starting their own business. And for that, I will definitely cover two great books. One's Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, who started Nike. And, you know, especially if anybody loves historical fiction, it is so fun to read that book and listen to Nike getting started at a time when there were like no computers, no cell phones. Phil Knight didn't even have the money to talk to his salespeople like out in the field that were selling his sneakers. They just wrote letters to each other. It was really, really interesting. Um, but then also just kind of the strategy and the frustration and the things come up. Um, it really doesn't matter what time it is. I mean, Mark Randolph, who co-founded Netflix, you know, fast forward 20 years and there's all this technology, but you're still having the same problems with people, same problems with government, all these things. It's really interesting stories. So uh, we'll have fun with that in January. So um, hopefully you'll sign up. Uh, if you don't get email alerts from the library, you should definitely sign up for email alerts because that's how I'm always reminded of really good programs. And then they always have the links in them. So it's easy to sign up. Okay, so that's planning ahead. Uh, oh yeah, we got to do this, the disclaimer. This webinar is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to provide investment advice. None of the real estate investments mentioned in this discussion group are specifically discouraged or recommended. If you plan to invest in real estate, you are a tax expert, lawyer, realtor, financial advisor who are aware of your unique needs and situation. Uh, we definitely talk about a lot of you know, big ticket items here and we wanna protect the library and make sure you don't think that we're telling you to go do anything because uh, like with any investment, you can definitely lose money in real estate uh, and you can also win, so we'll see. Okay, so why real estate? This is the investing discussion group. Isn't that a little bit on the periphery? 
So I, in, 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 in researching my second book, so my first book was Money in Your 20s. My second book is an introduction to investing for younger people or people who just never caught the bug early on in life. Um, but I read a ton of books to really get myself situated, find out what all the smartest people were thinking. And David Swenson is famous for uh, running the Yale Endowment. He ran it for 33 years. And uh, it was the most successful endowment in the country for, I can't even remember his track record, but he just, he just blew away his competition. And one of his secrets uh, that he reveals in his book, Unconventional Success, is his use of real estate and really um, kind of seeing real estate, you know, like everyone else is doing the same thing. They're doing the stocks, they're doing the bonds, things like that. But he really thought about real estate and had very unique ways of tapping into real estate. Uh, and he, even for the regular investor, I mean, he wrote unconventional success for the regular investor, not the institutional investor. He understood, you know, he was speaking to an audience of individuals, but he was like, try to capture real estate because of how real estate behaves and how it usually appreciates. And so I thought that was really interesting. And he also said he thinks real estate should be 20% of your overall portfolio. So um, something to think about. Uh, also, I personally, the most money I have ever made investing has been in real estate. Uh, so that, you know, I'm a believer, uh, you know, with a lot of caveats about you make all your money on the buy. I've always purchased things that were considered dramatically below the market. Uh, I have a few pictures here. You'll see that I'm not afraid to buy something that scares away other people. So that's part of it. Like I don't go near anything turnkey, like anything turnkey is going to be way, way, way overpriced. So um, yeah, so the experts think real estate is important. I've had tremendous success with real estate. Um, and you know there are ways to get in that are worth, worth a look. Okay, but you can't get in through real estate investment trusts. So I hate to tell you, and these guys, the uh, here's their lovely book, Joshua and Brendan will say on page 80, you have to get off your duff. So you can't just sit at your computer and you know buy real estate investment trusts. So if you don't know what those are, you know, just think of a mutual fund, right? Where money is pooled together and securities are purchased. So real estate investment trusts are the exact same idea. So all of these investors pool money together and they go out and they buy real estate. And you would think, well, we're done then, right? So it's, you know, here's, here's this product that's like, I'm tapping in to real estate. And I gave you some examples here of, so, so, you know, real estate investment trusts have ticker symbols, just like stocks. In fact, if you saw them, you know, like you you wouldn't necessarily know if you just had the ticker symbol that it's a REIT. You know, you just open your phone and go to your brokerage or whatever, and you just put in the ticker symbol and it spits out the same charts, the same, it looks exactly the same. Uh, but these are real estate investment trusts. So again, REITs are kind of like, you know, a mutual fund that just buys up some, it takes some corner of real estate, there's always a theme, you know, like the MAA is the rental apartments, public storage is public storage, Simons is, the, those are the shopping malls, right? So if you took these temper, ticker symbols and you look them up, here's the problem. It doesn't, it, it, it should be okay, right? Like obviously there's a money manager and someone's coordinating all, of, all the purchases of these real estates in these different markets. Why doesn't it work? Well, I don't know, but here's, here's the, the sad truth. So I took some time to go on Yahoo Finance and I took these three different REITs that I just showed you, the public storage and the apartments and the, the mall, the Simons, and I compared it to just the S&P 500. And as you could see, these REITs really track the stock market. I mean, so you're not getting any diversification. It's odd, like why would it do that? It, it's a completely different asset class. It is real estate, but they're, the, each REIT is behaving and moving the same as the S&P 500. So the same as the top 500 companies in the United States. So you're just not diversifying. You're not getting any of that benefit. Um, and then to make matters worse, 
Here's a look at just the most recent and the top, top line that kind of like darker blue is the S&P 500. So not only are REITs not giving you any diversification, on a price, they all did worse than the S&P 500. So you can't just sit at your computer and buy up real estate investment trusts and say, I've diversified my portfolio. I'm, you know, I'm getting my exposure to real estate. I'm fine. I don't know why. I mean, I could think you'd have to have a PhD in this stuff to understand what, you know, what the factors might be. Um, and, and these are just showing prices, right? So you are getting dividends, right? Like these real estate investment trusts definitely pay a good dividend. So if that's all you want, if you just want, you know, some to make some money on your money uh, and not hit it out of the ballpark and not have any diversification, okay. But um, I, it, it's definitely important to know that you're really not solving that real estate exposure problem from your computer just by buying REITs. We also have uh, a comment here that says not even Starwood question mark. Oh, that's a good question. Um, if somebody has the time to look up the Starwood ticker, then we can we can actually check it ourselves. Um, and I, I'll even show you how to do it. So somebody find the Starwood ticker. I'm sure we're going to have time later. And I can show you how I just went into Yahoo Finance and just, you know, it's very easy with their charting just to compare it. Um, so we will do that. Okay, so if we're going to have to get out in the field, if you're going to have to get off your duff and get your hands dirty, should we even be listening to these guys? So who are these guys that wrote this book, How to Invest in Real Estate? Well, they're regular guys. It's so interesting <laughs> when you get to know them. Um, they're just regular guys. They're just regular guys uh, that didn't really like their day jobs. Uh, kind of found out, well, why don't you give real estate a try? Like Joshua Dorkin, who's now a millionaire several times all over, he went to Washington University. He hated what he was doing right after college. Uh, then he became like a substitute teacher. Well, he went into, uh, he tried to make movies. He was, you know, the, the guy on the set who was working for free. He kind of like wandered around. Then he finally became a substitute teacher and his brother convinced him to try something related to real estate using the money he had made on a condo sale. Um, so, you know, these are not guys who studied this in college or anything. They, they didn't have family that was very knowledgeable about real estate, but they just kind of both um, got interested in real estate and then started having their share of success, but also their share of failure. And they, they were really kind of interested in both and wanted to be part of a community to talk about like, well, this worked, but that didn't. Is anybody else having the same, you know, um, experience that I'm having? Could anybody help me with a shortcut? So Joshua Dorkin started Bigger Pockets, uh, which was just kind of like a community to talk about the experience he was having with real estate. And I think, you know, people want community, especially if it's something that they're, you know, they can share their stories or get advice. And so Bigger Pockets just took off. And then once that took off, he had more money to do more with real estate and he was meeting other people. And at some point he pulled in Brandon Turner, I think, because he really needed kind of a business partner and a foil on his podcast and all these things. Um, but these guys are not really special in any way other than they really love real estate and they really love it as an asset class and they really love it as a challenge. So, um, you know, a bunch of years later, after listening to other people's stories, interviewing a lot of people, having their own share of success, they put together How to Invest in Real Estate, which is based on stories from a lot of their guests on their podcast, people who did all sorts of things, and from their own experience. And um, it's a little ADD if you <laughs> try to read it. I mean, I, I try to write, I try to be super tight, super concise, really get to the point, oh, you know, don't waste a page. Um, they don't seem to have that problem. You know, they're just kind of like telling a story, you know, and then Tim did this and then Sally did that. And, you know, it's fine. It's lively. It's not complicated. Um, and there are some gems in there, but um, they're really not, you know, they're not tycoons. They're just, they, either one of these guys could be, you know, your brother or your neighbor. Okay. So hopefully those listening, we understand that single family, and this is not just about buying a single family house or flipping a single family house. Real estate is so much bigger than that. 
Uh, these guys, they'd spend a lot of time talking about small multifamily as being a really good way to make money. So, and they, of course, they spent a lot of time in a single family house and rehabbing it, flipping it, or uh, buying it and then turning it into a rental property. But they really spent a lot of time talking about multifamily, small multifamily. So that could be two family, three family, some towns, you kind of see four family, it's a little tight, but definitely two and three family, um, you know, multifamily houses. Uh, and they talk about even the, um, they call it house hacking. I had never heard this term before, but when you intentionally buy, say like a three family unit and, and you know you're going to live in one of them, and rent out the other two. And the idea is you're sort of building wealth for yourself because the way the financials are gonna work out and what you're charging the other people is that you're gonna live rent free. So all of a sudden you have a, this mechanism of living rent free and making money that way by what you save. And then the money that you save can go toward other real estate deals. Um, and then also kind of being very hands-on as a landlord because now you're landlord to two other people. And so they really love that as like, you know, kind of a way of getting started. Uh, but then, I mean, they all, they cover a, a total spectrum because they also talk to people who, you know, been there, done that. And now 10 years later, they've earned enough that they're on to like 50 unit apartment buildings and things like that. Um, and even raw land, they talked to one guy who's, uh, they, so in their book, what they're doing is they're featuring a lot of people. These are people who were guests on their podcasts. And this one guy really got into kind of the, got the raw land bug. And he said that, um, you know, there's just nothing better and go into a town. All this stuff is public information and you find out, you know, you just start to find out who is back, you know, owes back taxes on some raw land. So, you know, someone's not keeping up with their obligations and this guy would just kind of like call all these people that he knew had problems paying their tax bill. And he would be like, I'll, look, I'll, I'll take the land off your hands. And he said it worked beautifully because there are people who really are kind of, I don't know, just not willing to make the effort to, they, they own an asset, but they're not being proactive. They're not going out there and being like, I'm having financial trouble. Let me go to a real estate agent and see if I can list this land and get some money for this land. Um, and the, these guys who wrote the book claim these are totally true stories. So it's interesting to me that, that somebody could go to a town, find out who's behind on their taxes on raw land, talk to those people, convince them to sell him the land for like pennies on the dollar of what it's worth. And then he flips the land and that that that's his revenue stream. So these are all things that are very interesting. I hadn't thought of. Um, I'm sure it doesn't work in Greenwich. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get out of Greenwich. We're going to get out of Fairfield County. I mean, I don't think things like land's not just sitting there that nobody's thinking about. Um, but in any case, when it comes to real estate, there are all these different things you can do. And in the book, you know, there's one guy who says it's all about, you know, there are like, he, they profile people in a lot of small towns, you know, go buy that strip mall that has like the workout facility uh, or the hairdresser or the bar or the whatever, like, you know, not a big mall, just like a, a, a well-placed small strip mall and become the owner of that. And you have all this cash flow from rent. And, and you know, these are all really, really interesting ideas. So it goes way, way beyond just the single family house. Okay. But I mean, again, you know, it's a multi hundred page book. So let's figure out the best use of 90 minutes and what, what might really kind of be a wow factor for you and a win for you. And I would say two things. I don't want to assume I know like your story, why you're listening. So there's the person who maybe doesn't have a lot of cash, but could they get started? Is there an opportunity there? And then there's somebody who maybe doesn't realize that they're sitting on a lot of money. It's locked in their IRA. Um, and they don't realize that you can actually change the custodian on your IRA and use your own money to invest in real estate. It's fascinating. It's totally true. A lot of people don't know it. It's legal. It's unique. It's, you know, it's special tax considerations. And we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about being prepared, right? Don't just jump in. You have to prepare a whole team and understand who needs to be on that team. You have to think about protecting yourself legally. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll also, you know, we said REITs didn't work. You can't just sit at your computer with a few keystrokes and buy some REITs. Um, 
But there are all of these, there's a trend in these like very professionally managed private online deals and they are legitimate. You know, the guy, there's one guy in particular, I just love every time I listen to him on podcast, he runs a company called Cadre uh, that is backed by Harvard University. I mean, like some really, really great endowments are backing this. Um, so those things are more private uh, and they might be, they might be good deals. Um, and then we're going to talk about some significant tax advantages just to make sure that you know that like real estate in general operates like a very, very different asset. I'm just going to take a quick peek at the chat because I want to make sure um, we don't miss anything. Uh, if you are 80 years old and buy high quality REITs for income, can you comment why it is a problem if you... Oh, no, it's not a problem at all. Oh, it's it's great. REITs are great. So if if you're just trying to do dividend income, and again, this is sort of like, you know, would you buy like a high quality bond or what, you know, if you just want to own something that has a good 6% dividend, that's great. I'm just trying to say that for people who they're trying to do something different and maybe they're trying to make more money, right? You know, they're, they're, they wouldn't be satisfied with the 6%. They're kind of hoping real estate's going to be a big win. Like they could do some transaction and make like 20 or 30%. Uh, and in that case, you can't just sit at your computer. Um, or if you can, it's not very well known. So these are these private deals we'll get to at the end. The private deals don't have to disclose how they're doing, but they they sort of suggest to the people who are interested that they do really well. Um, so we'll talk about that. But yeah, if you just want income and, and it's a good dividend, go for it. That's great. All right. What was the, uh, so that was one message. Oh, not even Starwood, right. So so at some point we're gonna look up the Starwood. Uh, let's look, we will look up, we will look up the Starwood REIT and compare it to the other REITs. Okay, so this is the best use of 90 minutes. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the passive investing and then we're gonna talk about, we're just gonna make sure everybody understands the significant tax advantages of real estate. Okay, so the first one, access to cash. So either you want something low cost or we're going to talk about this whole thing with the IRA. So low cost, this is my thing. Drive an hour away. Just drive an hour away. You see that cute little house? <laughs> like That's a house I bought for $106,000 in a safe neighborhood. Now, if you look at the slide, it was a total wreck inside, complete wreck terrifying but what what you kind of have to develop an eye for is like these the flaws are your friends and some flaws are very manageable so something can look really worn down really dirty like the, the people who lived in this house they were not well they they had problems um they were foreclosed on the house was disgusting but from what i could sort of gather it's like just you realize like well yeah it's gross but we don't have to rip out this kitchen you know those kitchen cabinets are going to be fine once they're sanded down once they're repainted so the the new picture is you know that's just that's the same kitchen those are the same cabinets so the old appliances were thrown out new appliances were put in but these are not expensive changes so um here i'm just going to read this one thing in the chat uh, please do the investing in RE with your IRA. Oh, we were we will definitely do that. Yeah, sorry. I'm, we have plenty of time. I'm just, let me, yeah, we, we have plenty of time. So, um, so that is coming. Okay. All right. So anyway, low cost. There's nothing low cost near here. You know, I don't even consider Stanford low cost. I have friends who've done things in Stanford. I don't consider buying something for $600,000 you know, a single family house, low cost. <laughs> I, I like to think 100,000, 200,000, 250,000 max, like that's, you know, that's the sweet spot. So you buy something that has a lot of flaws, looks scary, but actually isn't a lot of work to rehab. And that just takes some getting used to. And that's why it's, you know, great to build a team and know a contractor because, you know, a contractor can kind of has another set of like, oh, this would be expensive to fix or mm, this wouldn't be so bad. So uh, with the real estate deals I've done, like when you look at a driveway and the driveway is all broken up 
right? And the asphalt's all broken up and it just looks terrible. And you think, oh, that's bad. Oh, a driveway is so inexpensive to repave. You know, so, so there are certain things where at a certain point, if you really get into it, you will be excited about what's wrong with the house because you know it'll turn off other people. It'll turn, especially those, you know, the, the family where like they both work full time and big jobs and, you know, they won't consider anything that isn't already freshly painted and everything's perfect and things like that. I mean, there's a whole universe of people that are looking for turnkey. And meanwhile, if you if you want to invest in real estate, you make all your money on the buy, you make your money on the flaws. It's learning to embrace those flaws and being able to see past them. And, you know, and some flaws are are worse than others. Uh, so for another example, okay, again, this is nowhere near here. So this is a really, really, really pretty house, I think, um, that was $400,000 in a nice neighborhood because it just like the person who went in and cleaned it up and, you know, tried to flip it just didn't go far enough, kind of bought it. It was, a, a, you know, a, an estate sale, tried to flip it very quickly, but you can see like there's the land isn't right like the land the house doesn't even look anchored to the land it just looks kind of like everything's dead and gone and whatever so the front was dead and the back of the house literally i'm not kidding was this jungle it was this jungle it was crazy <laughs> like you look at the front of the house and there's there are no plants and then you look at the black back of the house and it was like a jungle it was so strange um but you know something like that is easily fixed with you get like a landscape designer you get you spend ten thousand dollars on on you know plants and trees and shrubs and whatever, um, and then the back was just a bunch of guys came with chainsaws and trucks and literally in one day they cleared the back of this property and they made it look park like and it was gorgeous. So again, like flaws are your friends. So if you don't have a big budget, you want to go nowhere near Fairfield County. Um, you'd want to drive an hour from here. This happened to be Hamden. I'm very fond of the area of like Hamden and Wallingford and things like that. Let me just look at this question. Uh, what particular indicators do you look for to identify an ideal area for a potential buy? What, er what areas or counties in CT have you found to be the best areas? Okay, this is a great question. So there is a website called greatschools.net. I think it's greatschools.net. I always look at the quality of the schools. That's gonna be super important. It doesn't have to be top of the line like Greenwich and Darien and New Canaan, but you, you don't want schools where like, you know, this. so they, they what they do is they rate the schools on a scale of one to 10. So, you know, if anything, you know, five and under, I'm not gonna go near. Uh, me personally, I also, um, I look up, there are crime statistics about different towns. And um, I, I was walking around with like this top 20 list. And so like, Cheshire and Wallingford and all of these places that are just adorable. Like Wallingford is my number one favorite right now. Uh, and, and that's, actually, I'll just show you the next slide. Um, hold on one second. So let me, okay, so this is, this is me, maybe I've gone too far. So this is my latest project in Wallingford and um, very cute house, bought it for $224,000. It's walk to town. Um, but the inside's a little scary because it's been empty for four years. It was foreclosed on. Then they had the pandemic and vandals came in, even in this very nice town. Wallingford's a very nice town. It's where Choate, um, I don't know if you've never he ever heard of the, um, the boarding school Choate is in this town, has a great library, great restaurants. It's adorable. Um, and this house was only $224,000, except it has no plumbing because vandals came in and they stole all the copper plumbing. So there's no heat, there's no running water. Um, maybe I've gone too far this time. Uh, but in any case, like I, I've, I've done well in the past. I find this so fascinating to be in a nice neighborhood, in a safe neighborhood. I mean, according to crime statistics, Cheshire and Wallingford are safer than Greenwich. And the housing there is so, so inexpensive. So to answer your question, I look at crime statistics and I look at school quality, but it doesn't have to be top of the line. You know, as, as long as you're getting, you know, a, a score of six out of 10, a score of seven out of 10, that's fine. Um, and then honestly, before I, before I buy anything, and I do a lot of research, I really look at like what the prices are going for. And I usually don't find things quickly because you kind of have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the right thing. Um, but then I always go to the police station 
and I ask for, and this is public information, they have to give it to you. I ask for the crime information on that particular street. And uh, this happened to me once and the lady said, are you really sure you want this? Because it's 25 cents a page. And I said, oh, that, that's okay. And she goes, it's 28 pages. <laughs> and I was like, now I don't need it, right? So um, in Hamden, Connecticut, which I've stopped investing in because it, Hamden's just kind of, um, it, it's getting too much of the New Haven influence and things like that. But there are really nice parts of Hamden. There are really compromised parts of Hamden. Hamden's right above New Haven. So I just stopped because the crime was kind of getting to be an issue. Although the prices haven't stopped rising. So, um, you know, I'm, but I'm very conservative. Uh, do you manage your properties yourself? I always manage my properties myself, but um, it's hard. You know, it's hard, it's hard dealing with a renter. So uh, yeah, uh, I, it's hard. And I don't know that I recommend that. Um, in fact, that probably it's probably stupid that I do that. It, it's probably a good idea to get someone, especially someone who can be tough when the rent is late, if you're trying to do a rental, because that's a really awkward situation. Um, okay, so maybe I've gone too far with this house that has no running water and the insulation is falling apart and things like that, but it's fun and you know, it started out at a great price. Okay, so this is my second book, which I just finished, all about investing. I'm an educator. I just like to teach young people or you know people who are unsophisticated about investing. And I tell them that they have to consider the risk-free rate and they have to consider alternatives to their investments. So um, maybe I need to practice what I preach because at the end of the day, when I look back on fixing all of this plumbing and you know ripping out the insulation and putting in the new and things like that, am I going to look back and say I could have just purchased a U.S. Treasury, uh, you know, for five percent <laughs> and like spent the rest of the time learning how to play tennis? Um, but you know, you really should be thinking about, you know, what are your assumptions if you make this investment? How long will it take? How much will it cost you, you know, if you're going to fix something up? Um, and you don't have to do things anywhere nearly as drastic. Um, and you could also just, you know, buy the two family that's in pretty good condition and you just become a landlord and it's about the cash flow. Um, and let's see, let's see. Uh, how about investing for your children in, so you... No, I'm not sure, I don't, I, I don't understand that question. Um, about investing for your children in real estate so you know the tenant. Um, maybe rewrite that because I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but then there's this thing or, or near universities. I love, love, love real estate near high quality universities or even high quality boarding schools, right? So you know, if you're near a high quality university or high quality boarding school, you can also Airbnb it for the big family weekends and things like that. Um, you know, it'll always kind of hold its value because of its proximity to places like that. So that, that's a great idea. That's a great idea too. That's great. And it's, and that's covered in the book too. They talk about that. Okay. So the IRA, this is really cool. A lot of people don't know this. It's totally legal. It's really cool. So if you've accumulated money, you know, if, you, if you've had a few jobs and you had 401ks and you had to roll them over into IRAs and you have some money, normally, what's normal if somebody has an IRA is, you know, it's at T. Rowe Price, I mean, it's at Fidelity, it's at Schwab, whatever, and they're investing in mutual funds or individual stocks or bonds or whatever. Well, you can take that money and you can change the custodian. So this is called a self-directed IRA. And, and I, I just show this because these are the, the two podcasts where I learned the most about it. Just, you know, the, the, so real lawyers, real people, you know, are real tax experts are on these podcasts saying, this is a true story. You really can do this. This is not weird and it's not illegal. And, you know, it's your money. Um, so th these guys on these podcasts were talking about it. And what I gleaned, is you know you have to use a different custodian. Fidelity's not doing this. Schwab's not doing this. Two row price is not doing this. Um, and then you have to follow certain rules. So yes, it's your money that you're using, and you're using it to invest in real estate. But you can't like buy a house with that money and then move into the house. And your family can't move into the house. And in fact, there are rules like you can't even like in the house that I'm fixing up now. Like you know, I fix it up. Sometimes I stay there even though it doesn't have heat or running water because I'm crazy. But um, 
If I were doing this with an IRA, I think I'd have to count the number of nights I actually sleep there. I think maybe there's like a two week limit. I mean, you're dealing with tax rules now, right? So, so it's very like, you know, you can't spend more than two weeks in this property, blah, blah, blah. Um, because you're actually using your money, but it's the IRA that's purchasing the property. Um, and you're definitely gonna wanna get tax advice on this, but it's fascinating because it's totally legal. Um, so, you know, you go and, and you have like this special checkbook that's from your IRA for you to go buy real estate. And you can also invest in real estate deals, you know, like, so when we talk later about these online, you know, private real estate deals, you can write a check from your IRA to contribute to those real estate deals. It's your money. You're allowed to do it. A lot of people don't know they're allowed to do it. Um, let me just see, was there another question about that in the chat? Okay, does, does not look like it. So it's called a self-directed IRA. You get a special custodian. So wherever your IRA is, you have to roll it over to a special custodian. I actually don't know, but I'm sure you don't have to roll over the whole thing. I mean, it's your money. So you could you know, take half from your, if it, your IRA is at Fidelity, roll it into a special custodian. And now that's your money to invest in real estate deals. Um, but again, like it's, you know, you can't do this for your own personal use. Like you can't buy a vacation home that you, in a good area that you think will always appreciate and value with your IRA money because you can't stay there. Your family can't stay there um, pretty much. I mean, I know there's, there's some rule about it. Like it's like a two week limit or something like that. Um, you can't be the real estate agent on the deal. So if you went to the trouble of getting your realtor's license, you know, you, you can't use it for this. Um, and the IRA is the pur purchaser, not you personally. So clearly this is like fascinating and could you could tap into a lot of money and could be the best use of your money, but you have to get expert advice to actually do it. Um, and, and so these guys who run these podcasts, uh, you know, they are lawyers and tax experts and things like that. That's pretty much why they're running the podcast. They're trying to promote their own business. Um, let me take a quick look at the chat. Uh, how do I find a special custodian? Right, so, okay, so I'm gonna go back one slide to these guys. Um, hold on, sorry. So these guys, do I have their names here? Uh, Brian Eastman and the Real Estate CPA Podcast, uh, the Directed IRA Podcast. So um, whoever wrote that question, if you know, if you're accustomed to podcasts and you you know you have the podcast app, if you just go in and you search directed IRA podcast, it's gonna download all the episodes and you're gonna see all kinds of experts who can answer that question. Same thing with the real estate CPA podcast. It's gonna download all these episodes and the host of the podcast is probably the CPA you could hire who could do it for you. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't drill down to like that specific thing because none of it was recognizable to me. It's not like, I, I didn't recognize the name of any of these custodians, but the, the fact is it's true and it's real. Um, and you might want to ask around, you know, your friends. I think friends and family are always the best references. You might find out your friends have been doing this forever. Um, I, I just think it's fascinating, um, but that, that would be my advice. Um, or if you have a real estate lawyer, ask a real, if you have a friend who's a real estate lawyer or a friend who's an, a tax expert. Okay. So that's that really interesting news. Now let's talk about prepare, you know, preparation. So if you're going to do any kind of real estate deals, you, you're going to need a team. Um, and you're, so I, I love, these are my kind of, you know, the team I lean on. Uh, so Bradley Baines, a lawyer. So, so where I go to do real estate deals, they don't use lawyers nearly the way they do here because the values of the property are so much lower. Um, but you know, if you need, if you wanted to start in this area or you're just sort of curious, Radley's a great lawyer. I put Jamie on here because if you have any questions about how you're going to finance a real estate deal, she is um, a loan officer. So she works for Loan Depot and she's so pleasant and accessible. And, and you know, she has all the stuff memorized. Like you could tell her like five data points about your income, your savings, your credit score. And she's gonna tell you <laughs> right off the cuff what you can and can't have. She's fantastic. 
Uh, Pete Prackley is a local guy that I have used. Um, I've hired him as a consultant just to come look at a house with me. And I'll be like, okay, Pete, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking if I bought this house, you know, maybe it would cost me 40,000 to fix it up. And he'd be like, Kristen, it's gonna cost you 90,000. Do not buy this house. Well, that was $200 very well spent. So, you know, just to get like his, you know, he's a contractor, he has the eyes, he sees how bad something can be. Um, so again, these are like the team members that you're gonna need if you're really gonna do something hands-on. Um, or you don't know if you're going to do something hands-on. You might you might be talking to Jamie and finding out what kind of loan you could get. Uh, and then you find out like, eh, you really can't, you know, the, it, your finances, it doesn't work. She's going to charge you 8%. It's going to have too many, you know, points on the loan, whatever. So um, but these are all the questions you're going to want to answer. And you're going to want to also know like a realtor and a tax expert. And in the book, they have a really interesting um, part about pulling in partners because obviously, if you can pull in partners and share the responsibilities and share the cost, that can be great. And they talk about their own personal experience with it. And they say, if you're going to do it, only do it if you're willing to talk to your partner every day. That real estate moves quickly, things change quickly, bad news happens quickly. And you communication, any breakdown in communication is really toxic. And so they say that, you know, there are all these benefits to having a partner sharing, you know, sharing the burden, but um, only do it if you're really, really good at being in a partnership and doing a lot of communicating. Let me just take this quick uh, look at the chat. Um, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this is great. I love when people put stuff in the chat. This is supposed to be a discussion group. So it's really, really wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, you know, definitely, definitely want to build your team. Okay, and now the LLC, you know, the other legal side of this is, you know, if you do something where you're going to uh, buy something, fix it up, or to buy something that's ready, and you're going to be a landlord, you have to, have to, have to protect yourself legally. I thought it would be really tacky to have a slide with like someone chasing an ambulance, <laughs> but you can imagine, I mean, so I have no slide on this. I'm just going to talk this point through that, um, you know, you want to form an LLC, you want to talk to a lawyer, an expert, how are you going to protect yourself? Because if you are a landlord and anything happens in the place that you are renting out, you can be sued and you can be sued for a lot and you can be sued. Um, and and this, is, this isn't me talking. I mean, this is me. I've always I mean, I'm paranoid. I worry about these things. Um, I have a nice umbrella policy and an LLC. But here again in the book, they talk about really, really cautioning people to be paranoid because your insurance can can max out. So, you know, if somebody hurt themselves on your property and they got like a five million dollar claim and your insurance is only two million, you know, you could be bankrupt. So, um, if you want to buy a house and flip it, right, you're fine, pretty much. I mean, I, I can't, I, I've never heard of a situation where whoever purchased the house then comes after the previous owner, you know, I mean, not in a, in a dire situation. They, they might come after the previous owner and say like, well, you never told me there was mold or something. I don't know. Um, but if you're going to do anything with real estate where you're thinking of having you're going to own a property long term and have people stay there and rent or even Airbnb or anything like that. You really want to protect yourself. And mostly that's forming an LLC. Uh, but there are other things, I guess, that you can do. But, you know, I'll leave that to you and, and your legal team. OK, passive investing in private REITs and deals. So this is not very well known. Um, but again, there's this trend in these online private options. It's almost like crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. So um, you can go to any one of these sites. So there's the Fundrise site, there's the Cadre site, and there's the Realty Mogul site. And th the site is set up like they're talking to you like, hi, you know, we know that you're interested in real estate deals. 
And we're, this is what we're doing now. We just bought an apartment building in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a great hot new market. And it's a 50 unit apartment building. And um, you know, you can get in on this deal. Uh, you can get in on the cash flow. Just spend twenty thousand dollars. You know, and and it, they're real and they're legitimate. And and these, you know, the the CEOs of these different companies are on all different podcasts, kind of talking about what they're doing. Um, now, for most of these deals, uh, and I probably should have had a separate slide on this, you know, the, the concept of an accredited investor, right? So there are rules that if uh, a particular investment seems a little too complicated, a little too risky, then only an accredited investor is allowed to participate. Um, now the whole accredited investor thing is a little bit of a mess because kind of anybody can buy any publicly traded stock and some of them are incredibly risky. So <laughs> it's not a perfect system, but the idea is just to put the brakes on certain investments. Um, so, but the, here's the funny thing about being an accredited investor, because the rules are like, like say you're married and you and your spouse combined have an income of $300,000. That's not that unusual in Greenwich, right? But you and your spouse could both be scientists and know absolutely nothing about investing. But as long as you're hitting that income level, you both are considered accredited investors. So you can do whatever you want with your money, even if there's really no evidence that you understand investing or you understand risk. Um, so the whole accredited investor thing is a little odd, but uh, because as long as you have a certain income, you're fine. Um, it also applies like you can have a much lower income, but you have a lot of assets, you have a lot of money saved. So then you're an accredited investor. So a lot of these deals that are private deals where, you know, you're, you're going to be asked to write a check for $20,000, you know, you have to prove that you're an accredited investor, um, which, you know, especially if you're older and, you know, all your retirement savings counts towards, you know, meeting that bar, uh, then you're probably fine. Um, but then if, you know, if you're younger and you don't have the income, you're not married, whatever, because uh, like someone could be married, like could be a school teacher, but is married to somebody with a much higher income. As long as you're married, you both count as accredited investors. Um, so anyway, it's just it's very interesting. And these opportunities, these sites are real. You know, I mean, I, I the cadre guy, I just love I, every time I listen to him on a podcast, he sounds so smart and so sincere. And he has. He's a Harvard guy and he his backers are like, you know, the Harvard Endowment invests in Cadre. And so you go on their site. Actually, I, you know, I wonder, we should just maybe go on one of these sites. Why not? It, it would work. Um, let's see if we do, let's just go to Cadre. Why not? I mean, this is our, the world we live in now. It's, um, you know, just everything's online and you never have to leave your house. So let's see. All right. Build a brighter financial future. Okay. Uh, invest directly alongside experienced professionals. All right. Let's see. What are their offerings? What are we going to see here? Ah, here we are. Okay. So they have some funds that you can invest in. Uh, they have, oh, so like here's this nice apartment building in Salt Lake City. Right, the harvest at Marmalade. Okay, the harvest at Marmalade. Okay, it's a multifamily, new build, looks great. Salt Lake, Lake City's booming, uh, fifty thousand dollar minimum. I mean, it's fascinating to me. Like, here's this website. It's totally reputable. It's backed by the you know this guy who went to Harvard and the Harvard Endowment and all these things. And it's like, okay, you want to have your hand in real estate? Well. Here's what we're offering. You know, you're just you're going to sign up online. We're going to re review your financials. You're going to have to prove you're a, an accredited investor. Um, but you know, you could really do this. Can and you share your I, screen because we can't see that? Oh, you can't see it? No. Uh oh. Because we're happened? we're seeing your slides. Oh, wait a second. I think That's... it might be. It's a pick which screen to share. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let's. Oh, here, sorry about that. All right, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so I'm sorry. I what I did was I went to cadre, c a d r e dot com. So cadre is one again one of these private online, and you just you kind of look at what they have. And cadre is this business that's going out to different areas like you know Nashville and Salt Lake City and the places that are considered more hot, and they're buying up properties or they're you know and and then you can buy a share in that property. So this is very different than a REIT that kind of like trades like a stock and things are going on with REITs that I don't totally understand. But, you know, now you're part of this, you know, you have a share in this complex and, um, you know, a cash flow deal, things like that. It, it's really kind of quite fascinating. So what are the ways to invest deal by deal? You can just look at all the deals. You could scroll through and be like, you know, do I want to be part of this industrial park in Sacramento, California. Now, I mean, people are saying like, oh, stay away from commercial real estate. It's all dying. That's not true. It's the, the office towers are really a mess. But, you know, the more we shop online, the more, you know, you need things like the, you know, the storage facilities, you know, the warehouse places. So um, in any case, why invest in cadre deals? Well, you can build your portfolio of real estate. All right. Um, uh, begin your commercial real estate investing journey. Okay. Um, in any case, I, I just wanted you to know that like this stuff is legitimate and very popular. So it, hopefully you learned something tonight, but now I'll go back to um, now, so a new share. Oh, let's see if I can do this. Okay, here we go. All right, so here, so I'm back to my slides. Hopefully you're seeing the slides now. Um, so these, all of these guys. Now, are you seeing the slides now? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So Fundrise, Cadre, Realty Mogul, all of these players where you can look at their holdings, you can participate. It's totally legitimate. Um, and that's, you know, a, a way to, something to do with your investing dollars. But it gets more personal. So this is another, this is another area that I think is so interesting. So if you're trying to figure out like, well, what am I, what am I trying to accomplish here? You know, I want to put my money into real estate. Well, some people really like a personal touch and there are, there are, private real estate deals that kind of cater to um, almost like identity groups and professions. So like this guy, Thomas Black at Napoli Capital, you know, he's a doctor who really loves real estate. So he kind of like stopped being a doctor and really got into real estate. And he helps doctors understand like their best options for real estate deals. So people, you know, the doc, he pulls money from doctors and, and, goes out and does new real estate deals. And you hear about this all the time, especially again on these podcasts where they're like, um, you know, whatever your kind of identity group is or your, maybe it's the college you went to, maybe it's the profession you have, right? Um, there's going to be someone who's like, well, I really cater to engineers. Another one was engineers, <laughs> was like, I understand how engineers think. I can talk the language of engineers. And he would like pull all the money from the engineers and then go buy like, you know, an apartment building and they all share in the profits. So um, it's just really, really interesting, these private deals that exist. Okay. So now, I, I, and I just want to talk about significant tax advantages. Um, and this is kind of going back to, you know, if you're going to buy like a single family or, you know, a multifamily, anything like that, the, as an asset class, real estate behaves so, so, so differently than other assets, because as you're making money, say you, you have a rental apartment, um, you know, like a multifamily, uh, like say, you know, you buy the three family and they, they're, they're all the renters and you have all this cash coming in. You would think since you're making money, I mean, you're, you have your, you have your regular expenses and you have your cash flow that you're paying tax on the difference, but the depreciation rules around real estate make it so that even though all this cash is coming in, you don't have to realize a gain because in fact, I think you're actually forced to, to depreciate. So this again, you know, you have to want to have your tax expert if you decide to go this route, but um, you're really not 
paying much tax on the cash flow from the rent because of the depreciation that lowers the profit from the rental income. Um, so this is kind of fascinating stuff. I'm just, I'm gonna check the chat one more time. Um, oh, okay. So can you email us your slides? I can, so so Siobhan, usually I don't share my slides, but I'm willing to share this set. Um, my other slides, you know, I it's a long story, but they were stolen once and used, somebody else used them as their own. <laughs> I was very upset. Um, but on real estate, I'm not worried about it. It's when I do like investing stuff. But Siobhan, then like, do you want to have a set of them or can people email me directly? I don't know what's, what's okay with you. Um, I mean, up to you. You can either have people email you directly or I tomorrow I can send out an email with the slides to everybody that's here tonight. Okay. Well, because I always give my email at the end, so I don't mind, but I just don't okay. know what the, what the rules are. Um, no, that's okay. Right. So significant tax advantages, just to know that they exist. Um, then there's this whole other thing called the 1031 exchange. So say, you know, you bought something it did really well, you're gonna sell it for a gain. Um, and again, you're gonna to wanna to talk to a tax expert about this. So obviously when you have a gain, you're supposed to pay a capital gain, but there's a 1031 exchange that you can do where as long as you, and there are rules, like as long as you, you know, sign a contract for your next real estate deal, using the money from your current real estate deal, and you do it in a certain amount of time, and then you actually, you know, continue with the deal, you're basically like rolling over your gain and not paying the tax. And it's called a 1031 exchange. Um, you know, I don't know where you find that anywhere else, right? <laughs> like, I mean, you know, once you're outside of a tax shelter, if you make money, um, you're gonna pay a capital gain. So if I, outside of a tax shelter, if I just buy a stock and it goes way up, I mean, if I, if I wait more than a year, then it's a long-term gain. But sooner or later, I'm selling it, I'm paying a capital gains tax. Um, you can completely avoid that with real estate. It's fascinating. So um, if you're going to start doing kind of hands-on real estate deals, you're definitely going to want to ask for tax advice in advance, because heaven forbid you find out there was something you were supposed to do at the beginning that you failed to do to get this 1031 exchange um, you know, benefit. And then there are opportunity zones, which is just amazing. It's like if you buy something in an opportunity zone, then when you know when it appreciates and you have a capital gain, as long as you follow certain rules, you never pay tax. Um, and I used to think that these opportunity zones would have to be really, really bad neighborhoods. I just that was just my assumption. Like, why would they give us such a sweet deal? Um, but it's not true. Uh, there's actually a guy in town who does this. And he was telling me that one of the opportunity zones is basically like if you walk on Innes Arden Golf Course and you walk the part that kind of hugs, it's in Greenwich, it's in Old Greenwich, but it hugs this part of Stanford. And he's like, Kristen, literally a few blocks from the golf course is an opportunity zone. And that's not a bad neighborhood. Uh, okay, oh, sorry. I love all these chats. That's wonderful. Definitely get these questions out there. What are some of the most useful tax avoidance tools or strategies you have found most useful throughout your real estate investing career? Um, absolutely, the, this kind of depreciation that's just automatic with real estate, where I had a renter and I had income from the rental and you know I had more income than expenses, but it, it never works out that way because legally you're depreciating, right? It's, it's totally legal. Now, now when you, but then when you go to sell, the de, the depreciation unwinds. I mean, I'm not a tax expert, but it, it's it's somehow like, well, you depreciated it, so so now you know in the, in the end you're showing more of a profit. But um, uh, but then that worked out too because we held it for a long time and and the capital gain was not that much. And um, but definitely the the. The depreciation aspect of real estate was the best, but I haven't tried any of these really fancy things like opportunity zones, and that that could be, you know, that would make a lot of sense. I mean, I if you can buy something near Greenwich in a nice neighborhood that someone for some reason is calling an opportunity zone and fix it up and then have no tax on it because it's an opportunity zone, that to me is fascinating. So again, this 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 seminar is just kind of like 
whetting your appetite, giving you a heads up. But if any of this piques your interest, then you know definitely call. You know, you can go back and call Radley Bain, our our, our uh, lawyer guy, um, and and you're going to get these slides, so you'll have his number. So you want to consult like a lawyer or a tax expert. Um, but these are all really really great ideas. Um, oh, I do want to mention the next webinar because I don't want you guys to forget. So in January, we're doing Celebrating Startups and hopefully you will sign up for that. And then here, I wanna make sure you have my email if you want these slides, or I guess, Siobhan, if you're gonna send the slides to everyone, that's great too, because th these slides, I don't mind at all. Yeah, why don't I do that then? You can send them to me and I will get that to everyone. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> I'm kjax at moneyinyour20s.com. This is a photo of my first book. Um, but Siobhan's going to send you all of the slides. So then why don't we go back and just kind of, well, first of all, if anybody has any real estate legal questions, you could definitely call Radley Bain. I'm, he's a local guy, very helpful. Um, call any of these people and you're going to get these slides so you don't even have to write down the number. Um, but let's go back to... All right, so this is, this is sort of what we were covering. The like, you know, you can go to a low cost area. Uh, I, I love the whole Cheshire, Wallingford area, just north of New Haven, uh, but there are just so many good areas. And looking at kind of the quality of the schools on greatschools.net, looking at, you know, crime reports, and you can Google a lot of this stuff. It's like, what are the 20 safest towns and, you know, and things like that. Um, let me look at the chat. I'm in my 30s. Is there a sequel to your book, Money in Your 20s? Yes, that's such a nice question. Here it is. Okay, hold on. All right, so this is my second book, Investing Your Lively Jargon-Free Guide to Getting Started. And it kind of, you know, it, it gives really fun stories. I like to make things very accessible, very relatable. So if I'm gonna tell you about bonds, and I think there are real opportunities in bonds and a lot of people don't understand them. They don't understand if you have a brokerage account, you can just buy yourself a treasury. It takes like two minutes and um, they're yielding, You know, they have really high yields right now, it's fantastic. Um, but if I'm gonna to talk to you about bonds, I'm gonna give you a specific like Apple You know, issued this bond. Ford issued this bond. Ford's bond is paying a really high yield right now. You know, do you want to consider it or not consider it? You can make, you know, you can basically make 8% on a Ford bond right now, but is that a good idea? Is the credit quality good enough? So I try to make, you know, I, I try to make investing very accessible, very relatable. Um, and so my first book was credit scores taxes, all the things that young people don't understand. They really don't understand taxes. They don't understand our progressive system at all. So they get their paycheck, don't necessarily think they're paying a lot in taxes because they don't know, you know, they had the 10% tax bracket, the 12% tax bracket, and then the next one was the 22% tax bracket. So they don't realize those last dollars are getting taxed at 22% just by the federal government. So first book was credit scores, taxes, how to live within your means, things like that, insurance, get renter's insurance, blah, blah, blah. This one is all about investing, but kind of in a lively, accessible way where I'm gonna talk about Starbucks, I'm gonna talk about Netflix, I'm gonna talk about Instacart. So, you know, I don't just say stocks, I actually give stories and things that, that it's relatable and you're gonna get it and then you're gonna know what to do next. Okay. so. Going back to, all right, so we talked about, you know, low cost areas. We talked about, it's not just, you know, a single family house. These guys who wrote the book, they love, love, love multifamily. Um, they also love the, the kind of like cute little strip mall, right? So if there's a cute little strip mall for sale that maybe has like, the deli, the hair salon, the coffee shop, that those are really, really good cash flow opportunities. I thought that was interesting. Um, and then if you're not going to do the like cute and little low cost, you can, if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you've saved a lot of money, but it's stuck in your IRA, you're going to find out about switching that, switching the custodian or switching, taking a part of it and putting it with a special custodian where you literally get a checkbook where you can do real estate deals with your own money. That's totally true. 
Um, you're going to build your team. We talked about building your team of, you know, figuring out now what realtor, talking to a good, you know, mortgage lender. You know, you should always, always, always be talking to these people before you start shopping around. Because if you find something good, you're going to have to act fast. So you're going to want to make sure that you have a team behind you. You're already approved for loans and things like that. Um, you're definitely going to get an LLC if you're ever, ever going to have a tenant because you don't want to get sued and go bankrupt. Um, does everybody know what an LLC is? A limited liability company. So it's like instead of going out there and just being like, you know, hi, I'm Sally. I just bought this thing. You're out there and, and you actually have the LLC purchases the property. Let me see what this is. Uh, what if you can pay cash? But I've paid cash. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I bought the house for $106,000, I paid cash. That was great. Um, and it's great up until you have a tenant, right? So like, I, I didn't have an LLC for that. But then like, once you have a tenant, I think you have to really start worrying about like liability. So, um, so, so, so that's, you know, a little... Yeah, you can you you can race ahead and use your cash, but then once you you start having tenants, you have to think about you know what's safe for you and how to protect your assets. I actually didn't get an LLC to be honest, but that's because I have a ton of insurance, so I have a humongous umbrella policy. Uh, that was just my choice. Um, okay, and then we also talked about the passive investing. That's the cadre and the fundrise and the realty mogul and you know, sort of tapping into those teams that are out there doing deals. And you just literally scroll through their website and look at all their deals and what they're interested in. And it's kind of cool. Um, and then we talked about the significant ta tax advantages. Um, I hope the 1031 exchange made sense because that's really, really interesting. If you buy something and you have a profit, then you're not gonna pay capital gains as long as you roll that into like the next deal. And there are really specific rules about what that next deal, it's the timing of it that is important. It's, it, I can't remember, I think it's 45 days. You have to be in contract on your next deal. And within six months, it has to close, I think. But don't hold me to it. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I got. I have really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed your questions. Um, if anybody has anything else about these different types of real estate, um, the guy working out in the right, I kind of think is, you know, the, the strip mall guy, <laughs> we've got the public storage, we've got the raw land. Uh, let's see, love all, I love all this chat. This is great. Um, can you form an LLC and a trust? That's a really good question. That's a great question for a lawyer. I don't know, but I'll tell you, I've had such great luck dealing with, cause I, I buy properties up, you know, closer to New Haven. And I found all the legal advice up there is so good and so much less expensive down here. So I formed an LLC for a different reason. And I used a lawyer up there who was like a third of a cost than down here. Um, how do we find out about strip malls, for example, that are for sale. See, I knew you were gonna say that. I knew you were gonna say that. Cause I was like, that's the one thing they don't cover in the book. They never talk about it. They, they're like, oh, Harry went out and bought a strip mall. They never mention how Harry found out the strip mall was for sale. So um, I don't know. And I've never tried to purchase one. So that's a really good question for, uh, you know, uh, I, or, I guess there are commercial realtors. Um, I wish I knew. I'm stumped on that one. They didn't cover it though, so it's their fault. Uh, you have to close in 45 days and not live in it for two weeks unless you are renovating. Oh, thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the 1031 exchange, I guess, right? Okay. You guys have been great. This is like the most interaction we've had. <laughs> I guess everybody loves real estate. Um, all right, any more questions? We've got a few more minutes. Enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, which housing, uh, uh, wait, so, uh, 
Okay. Oh, yes. 1031 exchange. Sorry. Let's see. What was this one? Are you concerned at all about how high home prices are right now? Do you think the rate at which housing is appreciating is sustainable? I do not think it's sustainable at all. I am dying to sell my house. My husband won't let me. I, I think we should cash out of Greenwich immediately. But um, that's why I don't shop in Greenwich. So the places I'm talking about that are like, you know, the Wallingfords and Cheshire's and Hamden's of the world, um, because you're starting at such a low base. I don't think, you know, if there's a reversal, it's not so catastrophic, but uh, what's going on with real estate here, I think is bizarre. I, I absolutely don't think it's sustainable. I don't think anybody should buy in this area thinking they're going to make money. I think that the young families that are buying are at risk, but hopefully they're buying because they plan to live here for 10 years so they can, you know, kind of weather a downturn. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's really scary. Okay, um, let's see. Do you see any similarities to the market now? I see a ton of similarity, don't you? Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's really, really scary. Um, this is a great presentation. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, what ROI range are you seeing on deals? Um, you know, I, I always, I, I gotta be honest about the ROI because they'll be like, oh my gosh, I made 30%. And my husband's like, yeah, but it took you, took you three years. You know, that's not how ROI works, right? Like, you know, you're annual. You're like, like that means you made like 10% a year. So um, I think you can make a lot, you know, you can make 20, 30, 40% if you buy, if you make all your money on the buy. So you gotta get that hideous thing that's so scary that nobody else wants to touch and you renovate it, you know, carefully. Um, and then you're, you are, you're making like 30, 40%, but it's over the course of more than a year. So, you know, it's like, to be honest, it's like, well, maybe you only made an annual rate of 15% or something like that. So, you know, I like to say the fish was this big, but I guess, you know, really honestly, it was, it was, it was still probably a 15 to 20% ROI. Uh, let's see. What if I want to buy a condo to live in Greenwich as opposed to renting? Um, yeah, I mean, the condos here are not crazy. I mean, just, you know, if you have a, a realtor who's willing to be honest with you, make sure she's showing that you the prices that they were like, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I guess, 2020. I mean, you just want to see like, how, you know, how much have things jun jumped up? Um, but, you know, condos don't appreciate in value anywhere near the way single family homes do. And you definitely want to keep track of like assessments. I mean, they talk about it in the book, too, that like they they stay away, like as from a, a real estate investment perspective, they stay away from condos because there are these hidden fees, these assessments that you can get charged and they don't appreciate in value. But if you just want to live there because you know that that instead of wasting money on rent, you'd be paying down a mortgage, then, you know, that that's a personal, you know, I, I think that that can make a lot of sense. That That's fine. Uh, come to Florida. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. All right, let's see. Do we have anything else here? I think that's it. All right, well, this was fun. All right, Thanks, thank everybody. you so much, Kristen. This was fantastic. And as Kristen mentioned earlier, her next, um, investing group discussion will be in January. That's going to be January 9th. So I'll send out the link for that too when I send out the slides. So keep a lookout for that. I guess tomorrow I'll send that out. That's great. All right, I got to take a picture of this uh, chat. It's so nice to see the, the compliments. You know, the next time I'm too tired to work on my slides, I'll look at that and be like, come on, Kristen, <clears throat> they like those slides. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, guys.